messaging up. Um, I'm going to try using the Q and A uh, approach. Hi, Julia. I'll give you microphone access. Let me know if I've forgotten anybody. Um, which means, so I'll just do the final few slides and then I'll switch to the Q and A mode. Uh, just a reminder, so um, I have a Google Doc that's open if you want to stick in any ideas around uh, topics we might cover, the format of these sessions, um, platform we use, or you know, resources that you think are interesting to point other people at, you can stick, stick them in there. Um, and so I thought I'd, I'll, I'm going to put these up as questions later, trying to use the, the newfangled uh, question and answer mode. So I thought, first of all, um, you don't, don't answer these now, but we'll go through all of them. Um, I thought it might be interesting to just ask people what they're planning to do at their various um, institutions and what we're doing at the OU, uh, just in, in sort of crisis mode, what's happening, uh, whether there's move to project base, other issues in that, uh, what concerns people have around dealing with plagiarism, uh, the, the controversial, perhaps not very controversial question I asked on Twitter just now, like, does this mark the end of exams? You know, when we go back to to post-COVID, will we ever go back to exams again? I think it'd be an interesting topic for us to discuss. Um, sometimes I think there's a tension with the requirements of professional bodies. You know, so if your degree is accredited by a professional body, they sometimes put requirements on. So I'd be interested to hear if anyone has of those. Um, uh, experience of e-portfolios. Uh, we can talk about some of the people have it or I think shift into more e-portfolio based approach. Um, how people want are assessing group work, collaborative work, uh, if they have issues around that. Uh, and then lastly, uh, what does the research say? But those were just things that came off my head. Um, you might want to have very specific questions, so feel free to ask those. Um, and just always like to end with the pictures. My dog, Tyler, if you don't know, by the way, um, who's lying behind me. Uh, OK, good. So I'm going to switch to the question and answer mode now. This is fancy. So what I'm going to do is, I don't know, I'm not sure this will work, um, but I'm going to post, so if I post a question in the chat, then I click the little, so in the chat box now, you should see there's a, a kind of chat icon and then a question mark. So if you make it as ask a question, then it comes up, I need to post it first. Okay, so that's come up as a question here. And then if I press publish, it's exciting, isn't it? I'll tell you all exciting. Ta-da, it should come up there. I don't, don't think that means anything. We just carry on chatting. But um, I thought, if, as I'm recording the sessions, it, may, it might at least make them a bit more um, interactive for people to look at. But also, I think it means we can um, sort of focus on one question at a time, maybe. But if you want to ask a question, so just stick it in the chat and make sure you've got the, the blue question mark. Uh, icon clicked and then it come up as a question. So um, everyone should have microphones. If you want to speak, feel free. If you want to go in the chat, um, go ahead. I, I wonder what people are doing now. Um, I'll just say some of what's happening at the OU. Um, lots of, so we don't have that many exams. We do have some still. We have a lot of what we call EMA end of module assessments, which are um, um, or project based, those kind of things uh, which students submit, they're kind of bigger than a formal assignment. Um, so, um, if I publish yours, John, will I get rid of mine? Yes, um, so John's uh, added the next question maybe are you responsible as part of that managing with large staff absences? Is that common? Yeah, so as I was about to say, um, we've cancelled a lot of those EMAs, or those, those sort of project things at the end of the course. Um, and we're just going to try and assess people on continual assessment. And there's been a mixed response to that. Um, I think some students are, are very pleased because they're dealing with crises themselves, but others are uh, a bit fed up. You know, they put some work into it already to have it kind of taken away. And others are thinking, you know, it's actually working on that, but been useful for me now I'm at home. So it's not a kind of easy decision to make, but I think it's when you make the decision, you can't. You can't do it sort of um, piecemeal. You can't say some courses we're going to keep it on, other ones we won't, because the students who are working across courses will have a, a strange reaction, a mixed bag. So um, and I think partly that question was asked, 
Uh, but the, apparently that decision was made, as John says here, to deal with possible staff absences, um, or if, if, whether that's due to the virus or just um, extra pressures of people now at home with children. But also, I think, largely to help students, you know, so it wasn't really a, a capacity issue so much as, as much as a kind of, I think, a supportive issue to try and help students deal with this kind of thing. Um, and I think, you know, there, some people have different views about it. So I'll let everyone else to jump in and say what they've been doing. Remember the microphone is yours if you want. You just need to scan up where my face is and there should be a little microphone icon below. Um, and click on that to go green. You should go to speak if you want to. Uh, I'm going to move on to Ken's question. So these are all kind of related, so we're not sort of going off topic here. Um, so Ken asks, how do we help educators to let go of so many details without the fear of not covering all the content? I, I think that uh, do you want to speak to that, Ken? Um, I don't know the answer, Martin, other than uh, <laughs> uh, it's as a faculty member um, and someone that tries to help my colleagues, I think, and I see that with my kids as well and their teachers overloading them with work. And, and my, my point to my, my children is your teachers are probably worried about if they're doing the right thing and, and doing what their their bosses are telling them to do. So I'm, I'm wondering how we, leaders in the community like yourself and others, Martin, how, how do we um, give people the courage to just let go of a lot of things? Okay, can I check? Um, thanks, can, can everyone else hear Ken then? Because I could hear him fine, but Emma says she couldn't hear Ken. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. So I don't know why I couldn't hear Ken. Um, I think it's a good question, Ken, and I think partly it comes down to, um, I don't want to lose Stephen's uh, comment, I'll come to that in a minute. It comes down to um, what assessment's for, isn't it? I think some people think they're assessed, and some views are you're assessing to make sure people have understood all of the content. Um, I mean, at the Open University, certainly, for our, we, we split our, our assessment up into continual assessment. And the kind of uh, end of course assessment and certainly the continuous assessment the purpose of it is to help develop understanding and dialogue so that a lot of our stuff is based around feedback from the associate lecturers the tutors um, so it's really about developing understanding rather than testing uh, existing knowledge um, and i think that's that can also be true of the the, the final assessment um, if it's really meant to be about um helping people develop the processes they need, I think, rather than sort of having that kind of full coverage. If you do, if you have a project, it's never going to cover everything in the, in, the, in the context, but actually what you're trying to do is get them to demonstrate the skills they need. So I just want to read out Stephen's, com uh, Stephen's comment. Uh, the work around exams, etc., have revealed how we need to be very clear and explicitly about surfacing any ethics that are at play in our subconscious. There are no, I might ask you to expand on this, Stephen, if you can. But no solutions that do not involve some collateral damage to one group or another. Yes, I agree. I've been arguing we should design our responses so that the least resilient students are not disadvantaged by any new decision. This is a different effort from trying to ethic from trying to please the best students with the greatest resources and resilience. I think I know what you mean there, Stephen. Do you want to elaborate? You should be able to speak. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Stephen. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Everyone else here, Stephen? Yeah, I got I got um, beginning of last week and really throughout last week when I was watching the Open University working really hard behind the scenes about, well, what what can we do to help students because we can't have physical exams? Um, I mean, that's one problem, but there is another problem, which is that even those courses that don't have an exam and have an end of module assessment and EMA, so they in principle can be done just as as normal and we were being really quite self-congratulatory as an institution um, slapping ourselves on the back saying we are we are open in a closed world and we'll do everything to remain open and I 
felt and got very upset that we were focusing on our capacity to be open, but we weren't really understanding that a lot of our students, particularly the ones who are least resilient, perhaps with the most challenging housing conditions or family conditions or who've lost their jobs and have no money, etc., the, the least resilient students were trying to, we were offering them a service, an open service for them to study in a closed world, but essentially parts of their life were closing down or changing. Um, and so I had a lot of colleagues saying, oh, we've had been contacted by students saying they, they're begging us to keep the end of module assessment or to keep this. I was thinking, well, what, you know, that's only a subset of students that have been emailing you and begging you to do it. What about the silent ones? And so I worked with an organizational ethicist to try to surface some of these, some of the ethics which we weren't discussing with each other professionally. Um, and I produced a presentation and I sent it to faculty and it got completely ignored. <laughs> But I, I was proud of the work that I did to try to think through, you know, what, what is fair and equitable as you respond and change the assessment. Um, and it's, it's never going to please, you can't not have a group that is, you can't please all the different constituencies of your, of your class all the time. And so I came down on the side of protecting the least resilient and the most vulnerable. And if that means that one or two very successful students are disadvantaged, well, so be it, because there is no way of not having any collateral damage whatsoever. I th I'd be interested to read that, Stephen. Thank you. I, th I, I agree. I think you've kind of got to take a utilitarian approach here, and this isn't business as normal. You know, and I, I agree. You know, in some ways, um, what the current crisis does demonstrate is the kind of robustness of distance education to many regards. But that doesn't mean that it's the same for everyone at home, and that might be better long term but we have to make decisions now in the current crisis i think that suits students and i, I agree with you and, and I, i've heard those same arguments some people said we really want to continue so i think it wasn't an easy decision for anybody um but yes um yeah well, Stephen, ken um you should blog that you see Stephen. that's the advantage of having a blog you just put it <laughs> you don't need anyone to read it you've got your own thing um i'm going to put the next question it's not really a question uh but just if anyone wants to cover if, we, if we've got nothing to say about these um you can just uh, ignore them and move on to the next one so um the next one is moving to a project-based approach um i wondered if people had thoughts on this so we um we did this quite a lot in the open university so when i first joined a long time ago it was mainly exams based um and we moved to uh, project based across most courses now, or many courses. Um, and there was there were issues, you know. I think the issues we encountered were, you know, people worried that it's the students' own work. Um, mainly that and kind of, do you cover all of the work? Does it advantage some people more than others? Those kind of things. Um, the, the the approach we run at the OU um, in terms of determining whether it's the students' own work is. Uh, we ask their tutors, who they have quite a lot of contact with throughout the year, uh, to sign a form that says, I can't quite remember the kind of legal wording, but like, to the best of their knowledge, this is the student's work. So it's really just there as a kind of check. So, you know, here's a student who's been producing bad stuff all year in all of the forums and doesn't seem to be getting anything, suddenly produces this most marvellous <laughs> You know a project at the end and it might be a cause to raise concern but because we have quite a lot of interaction with our students over you know sort of um, a nine month period or something the, the tutors do build up a picture of who they are i mean it's, it's not foolproof you could pay someone to pretend to be you for the entire nine months you know it's like um and but then you could pay someone to go to university for you, i guess so i guess no system's foolproof but it seems quite robust actually i think um and and obviously we kind of do the, the usual plagiarism checks and those kind of things. Um, so John says, do I need to distinguish between individual and small group work? Um, for project-based, uh, I was going to come on to collaborative. Do you mind if we park that, uh, John? Um, so I do wonder if anyone else wanted to come in on um, if people in other institutions, would, they, would there be an issue about moving to project based over exams in particular topics they think the disciplines or
So Emma, you say the marking is an issue. Um, I should say our final projects are usually double marked. Um, so they're marked by their own tutor and then marked um, blind by another tutor. Um, and the, as long as they're within a certain mark, uh, they get the average of those two marks. And if they're outside of a, a certain disagreement, we ask them to mediate between each other. And if that doesn't come to a solution, we then um, sometimes they're, they're third marked then. Uh, what did you mean by the the marking is an issue? Was it get, getting enough markers, or the sort of the sort of load that will fall on an individual academic? Okay, yeah. So you, so Emma says you have more than three hundred students on some modules. So with the yeah three yeah, three hundred students producing like a. A five even just a five thousand word project at the end is a, it's a chunk of markings i mean it, it, but maybe that's the type of thing we have to build in to the cost of courses like you know, having those sorts of things uh, having a tranche of markers on board for those uh sorry claire can you elaborate on what psrb is If you want to speak, by the way, Claire and Emma, you do have uh, microphone ability. Hi. 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 That's Claire. Yeah. Um, yes, the PSRB, one in particular, um, has been very awkward and very inflexible and not allowed us to change our mode of delivery. We've had to uh, stick to an exam. And as a consequence, they, the students have got to do it six months later. Obviously, there's regulatory requirements, so they want to adhere to those. Yeah, I think this comes on to a later point, isn't it? Yeah, there are. I wonder how long that kind of stuff will last, and whether they'll be able to keep up those kind of things. Just that kind of um, those kind of rigid requirements that they've kind of always had. That, uh, that, that it's like a lot of these things, isn't it? We kind of um, have said for years we can't do the all these things in different ways, and suddenly. It turns out we can do these things different ways. So I think there will be quite a bit of pushback on that, I think. Uh, but now no, I do take your point. Um, so Ken says, yeah, if people want to use voices, that's good. He likes hearing voices. Um, but you, you so but in, in general, you were saying, Claire, your students have welcomed um, move to project based approaches of exams. Definitely, definitely, because they, they hate exams. Where are you based, Claire? That sounds like a good Welsh accent. Um, I'm in um, Swansea. Okay, cool. Just down the road. I mean, my daughter wants to go to Swansea next year, so. Uh... Uh. Sorry, I didn't turn my microphone on. Dealing with, dealing with plagiarism. They're showing up as you post in these pictures, these questions, Ken. They are, so you're, you're now responsible for everything, Ken. Um, I, I think plagiarism it probably comes under the last one as well, um, going across all of them. Um, but I, I think in general, the, the point of plagiarism is going to be we need to rethink our assessments. Um, and we've already been fighting in many ways a, a losing battle with plagiarism with turn it in and all those kind of things um and as you reshape the type of assessment you you, you give people then there's a possibility i mean it depends on discipline a lot actually so if anyone wants to jump in from a different discipline so why those kind of more in-depth um project-based approaches don't work well there um but i think in general what plagiarism often reveals is just a, our own kind of lack of imagination around assessment so I, I think I mentioned in the previous week I used to be an external examiner um, on a computer science uh, course and they were really strict about plagiarism but actually uh, like plagiarizing bits of code 
is exactly what you want to do in computer science. That's how it works. You know? so, 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 so rather than saying this has to be pure code that's all you own, what, what, what would be a better approach is here's this bit of code I've nicked from somewhere else, and this is why it's a good bit of code. You know, that becomes a, um, you know, a, a more useful way to kind of think about that, that approach, I think. Um, so then if anyone wants to come in on, on plagiarism. I can hear someone whispering there. I don't know who that was. <laughs> but if it Sorry, Martin, it was my husband. <laughs> was it? Hello, Claire. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a programmer. So he's <laughs> you. <laughs> you can mute your microphone. Uh, All you right. Just right. Turned on as well oh, if you sorry, want to. Right, right. Now that's cool. Hello, Claire's husband. So Ken says, isn't that what all learning is, Martin? Of course, even credit is important. Yeah, that's right. And I think, um, so, but by not much of a flip, you can sort of get around some of that prejudice and problem. Uh, so Julia says, um, visas and immigration expect English proficiency exams to be examined. Um, so many EAP, English faculty and purposes providers are, are desperate to convert online exams to test the traditional for skills, for skills, uh, speaking, listening, writing, reading. These exams are generally timed how do we rethink the concept of time control assessment? Yeah, I think that, that is a good one, Julia, because I think that, that that is the type of exam where you may well get quite a bit of cheating. So they kind of do want to retain some quality control. And it's not uh, language learning isn't my area, so I don't want to sort of speak out of turn or off the top of my hat. Um, but we are hearing, perhaps this comes back to a kind of different issue on exams as well. We're hearing sort of quite a lot of horror stories about these exam proctoring services and stuff they don't seem at all student friendly so there was one that they saw online and again you don't know kind of how anecdotal stuff is but uh, of the student um vomiting into a bucket as she was doing the exam but being told she couldn't move you know she had to carry on with the exam by the person who's sort of remote proctoring her and it's just like what really is this? you know so it just seems like recreating the, the exam conditions online um, is just a, a strange move. It's, it's like when we have new media and we recreate what we did in the old media kind of thing. Um, but yeah, you're right, Claire. The, the OU is moving away from exams, so we don't do it much. But I know lots of other institutions are kind of still stuck in that that mode. Um, I see Alison's joined us. I'm giving you microphone access as well if you want to join in, Alison. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on plagiarism otherwise i'll move on to the next question oh the next one's a good one and so maybe this question is really the meta question for all of them which is um will this mark will this mark the end of exams ken asks again <laughs> no, it's not really as ken too. um and I think it, it, it's difficult to know, isn't it, when we come out the other side of this, if we ever come out the other side of this, you know, what the other side of this constitutes. Um, but I think we, exams will be one of the areas where people begin to look at it and say, do we really want to do that again? Not for accounting, Claire says. <laughs> I bet you're right, Claire, yes. Um, or medicine, yeah. I mean, I think there are different, even in medicine, you've seen quite a shift in some things to these kind of problem-based approaches and working stuff through in there. And I think you might see more of a hybrid, but you're right, the public medicine's often very traditional. And and um, law as well, in a lot of these um, the professions where there's kind of very strong kind of vocational body um, wants to do that. And, and I think, yeah, where there's kind of um, practic practic practical um, exams and those kind of things, are very, but perhaps you might see more of a, a mix So anybody want to come in on, on the death of exams? Or, I mean, I think I think exams take a lot of bashing, don't they? It's like they're kind of they're an easy thing to to knock, but I mean they've proved to be remarkably resilient, haven't they, so far? So it'd be interesting to see whether they do come back in, in full mode. Yeah, I think so, John. I'm going to make yours question, John. Maybe we need to unpick why we do exams. Time limited, identity check. Yeah, so I mean I think the Identity is a big thing. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in. I'm doing a lot of talking. Do you want to speak to this, John? Uh, 
Uh, can you hear me now? Sorry, I was fiddling with the buttons. Yeah, I can hear John. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, uh, well, I, I think for the OU, identity check is has always been a part of it, hasn't it? Um, uh, I think for a lot of courses, people are getting happier with the idea of using an EMA and so not thinking of an exam as, uh, you know, regurgitate as much as you know in a limited amount of time. So um, I'm thinking more in terms of skills and so on that you mentioned earlier. Um, so when you translate that back to the more traditional ideas of exams, um, you begin to wonder, you know, why do we need exams? Um, and why not have open book assessment, maybe time limited, but, uh, you know, a day rather than an hour or something? Yeah, I agree. Um, and there are um, moves to online platforms and so on that give you some measure of control over identity. Uh, so maybe in, there becomes a, a technical answer to identity checks. Um, as well as the, the sort of thing that you talked about, which is about actually having a tutor as a stand-in between you and the, the student. That's a long-running thing, so you do understand whether or not it is the individual's own work. Yeah, I agree. Um, nice bird song in the background, John, by the way. Very, oh, right. <laughs> very very um, peaceful. <laughs> I have to say, I am actually sitting on the veranda, on the porch <laughs> in, in the sunshine. Sounds very <laughs> idyllic. Been found out. <laughs> <laughs> no, why not? Why not? Um, so I think Claire says, um, in I think in the light of COVID-19, uh, GCSEs and A-levels will be viewed in the entirety, no longer fit for purpose. I think that's interesting. My daughter's just, well, not, not done her A-levels. So she was doing her A-levels this year. Um, so she was doing two A-levels and one B-tech. And the B-tech was, um, of course, mostly coursework. And so she's missed the, the very last bit of it of that because of school closures but generally you know she's done all the work and um whereas the a-levels there's this strange sense of sort of anti-climax for the the children in her uh, the young people in her year it's like okay we've been building up to this big thing and then it's not there but um yeah no school prom exactly Claire. <laughs> no school no school prom no school hoodies or any of that kind of stuff but yeah there is a kind of strange it, i think what the crisis reveals for all of us for all parts of education is where there's frailty and a lack of resilience for want of a better word in the system and, and we didn't really realize this before but now those now those weaknesses have been exposed I think it's going to be very hard to go back to versions that that reintroduce them um, mariana says i'm working with apprentices uh, level four in it and exams still compulsory there is project based project remedial. Yeah, doing classes, doing exams, almost right of passage. Yeah, my, I think my daughter felt quite. Like, you know, she built herself up to it psychologically in a way, but maybe that's just because that's the practice. You know, once you change it, you know, it's no longer the practice. But, uh, good. So we've killed exams. Next thing. Um, does anyone else? By the way, other people jump in with questions. I'm only doing this to kind of. We don't have to get through my questions. Um, hopefully, I have to go off piste. I wonder if people had any, uh, I think you touched on this earlier, uh, Claire, was it um, about professional body requirements, you know, um, how much they will continue to influence things, whether there'll be a pushback on those. I mean, that, but I, I have some sympathy. I think, you know, part of the point of a lot of these professional bodies and part of the, the point of universities is they've been around for a long time and they've been around for a long time because they don't jump to every you know current trend and stuff um that's part of the, their, their immutability is kind of part of their appeal in a way but there does seem to be i think we're gonna have to look at those a lot of those now so is this really where is it necessary where it, not just default to the mode we've always had but i'm interested to hear other people who perhaps deal with professional bodies more than i do So hi to Madeline. I've given you uh, microphone, everyone has microphone access this week. Madeline, you've joined us before. 
if you want to turn the microphone on, you can hover over where you can see me talking a little mic um, button should pop up and you can click on that to go green. So, um, thanks, Martin. Yeah, that's good. And you can mute it as well. Uh, so we don't hear everyone typing, but you should be able to speak if you want to. Um, and we're using this question and answer mode. So when you type a question, if you click the blue ask question thing, it becomes a, a question. So uh, John says, internationally, I wonder how tightly accreditation is tied to exams. I think that varies across. I don't know if you want to expand on that, John, but I think it varies very much across different degree structures, doesn't it? And uh, it depends what bodies you do. Uh, oh, sorry, think back on exams, not professional bodies. Uh, yeah, but I think that's, you're right. I think there is a bit of that, um, whether in certain places they still view the exam as, as, as the key. Um, but I think there are enough kind of QA bodies now around now that have kind of recognised it. I don't know if you want to expand upon that, John. Well, I... I don't know, other than I think it might be an issue because uh, in some places the accreditation, um, I'm not talking about professional bodies now, but in terms of national uh, structures, either through a QA agency or a Ministry of Education or something, it's very tightly um, circumscribed by the, the course specification. And if that includes an exam, um, you're not at liberty to change it. Um, so I don't, I don't know how flexible those higher level structures of QA agencies and um, education ministries and so on will turn out to be, but it's obviously an issue they're going to have to think about. No, it's a very good point, actually. I think you're right. So even if at the institutional level you want to do it, is um, um, you might not well be right, kind of like at a kind of government level, this is what's recognised. And I've heard people say that, you know, they... They have to give exams in order for it to be recognised. They have no flexibility. Uh, Ken says the deep issue really is what's the exam really showing that goes for either written or, yeah, and especially high pressure timed exams. Um, and Claire says the Ministry of Education can be very powerful in a lot of countries. I think that's right. Um, and often slow to move, I think, because if it's a political move, then you know, we see it in the UK as well. You know, when, um, first thing, a lot of Ministers do come in as they want to be tougher on exams, you know, return to basics, those kind of things. Um, they want to be sort of caught out doing it, anything new that could possibly go wrong. So, my next question is again not a question, I'm good at questions, those questions aren't questions. Um, I wonder if anyone has uh, experience, wants to talk about ePortfolios. Uh, um, I think ePortfolios have been around for a long time, so since the early 2000s, um, and they kept being portrayed as the thing that's going to change education. Um, and they didn't really take off. We worked a bit with them in the you know, OU. The idea was to develop this portfolio full of different tasks that you could then um, uh, take around with you um, and, and to different employers and things, and, and you could have different views on that ePortfolio depending on who you want. Um, a lot of the early stuff there. So Claire says, I use one file with the other units, but no. <laughs> I mean, we developed our own new portfolio system that was clunky in there. And often they kind of became very tidy. But I know other people have really got into them. So there's a there's an e-portfolio um, consortium in Ireland, for instance, that have, that have used it quite extensively. And I think it's very useful when you start restructuring uh, your learning to match a portfolio. So um, you, know, you break it down to smaller tasks that then kind of assess. And I think also for, for learners, that kind of helps with a lot of that that motivation. If anyone wants to talk about your portfolios. So, yeah, Ken says, uh, I often say, your blog is your e portfolio. And that was part of my problem with them, that actually they didn't sort of match anything you'd do anywhere else, whereas using a blog as your e portfolio was something you might well sort of carry across with you. Um, but I'll let someone else speak on e portfolios if they want. Uh, Stephen, I don't know if you want to come in here, if you're still there. Um, perhaps it, so Stephen has done work on uh, digital photography courses, you know, so I wonder, so that they are, that, that much is, there's much more of a sense of building up a, a portfolio as you go. I don't know if you had any comments on that. <clears throat> well, we use peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, learning in our 
Open University Digital Photography um, course, TG089. And we use something called Open Studio, uh, where students are encouraged to post their visual work um, and peers can comment uh, on on others' work and, and they can receive comments. In fact, that Open Studio software is used in a, over 50 courses. It's not just used for photography, but it can be used for design. It's, a, it's a, called Open Design Studio. It can be used in arts and humanities as well as in the sciences. So um, that's one way in which they build up a, a bit of an e-portfolio, but it, it takes the onus away from curating um from curating your blog uh, f from gardening so when it seems to be that when students are invited to curate a, an electronic presence on the web and um, there can be a tendency to focus on making it look pretty and um, doing the gardening and that's okay i mean that's that's graphic design that's about communications there's some there's some practical skills, there's some professional skills. But I think generally at the Open University over the years, we've tried to strip that away and limit the amount of choices that people have to uh, do their pretty gardening and to concentrate on the learning outcomes and the material that we're supposed to be focusing on in that particular course. So I don't know, that's just a few random <laughs> reflections on ePortfolio. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, and I think what Claire says students don't like Open Studio. <laughs> I, I'd use it, of course. I didn't mind it. I thought it was okay. I think part of the problem is that it is it is this closed wall kind of thing. You know, so um, students, so it doesn't kind of have any real sense to it. Uh, but it does. it is very structured. And I think, I think you are, there is a, in some ways that helps in not giving people too many options. I mean, if you give people a WordPress blog, then you, know, you can spend all your time exploring 500 different themes that you want to do, which is, I guess, your do, doing the gardening um, frames, I think. Um, but I, I wonder whether we'll, it was interesting, uh, this is a, a side piece of snarky comments, so uh, do, do with it as you will. It was interesting when um, uh, blockchain was the big thing last year, people said, like, blockchain is going to transform uh, higher education, it's solving you a problem you didn't know you had, which is that um, students can now be assessed on small bits of small tasks that they can take with them wherever they want. Well, that's just what ePortfolios did. It's just you may think we haven't thought about it before what we have, but um, but I wonder whether you know one of the results of this, if we do see the demise somewhat of exams, will be a kind of resurrection of ePortfolios as, as a form of assessment. Um, so Julia asked, should this? I'm going to post your question as a question, Julia, because it's a good question. Um, to Julia asked, should ePortfolios be assessed or not? Should they be formative or summative? Um, I'm happy for them to jump in here. I don't know if you want to expand on that, Julia. And I think they can be both. That's the point of them. So you can just, it's, it's kind of evidence of all the bits you do, but you can present which elements you want to be assessed. So it becomes much more like a kind of an artist portfolio in that sense. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in those, yeah, both, if I'm seeing. If they're not assessed, students will not do them. Yeah, well, that, that's always that's always the case. That's the case. Yeah, that is the case. If, if, but the, but they do also allow you kind of to demonstrate activities and those kind of things. So, um, well, if I can think up in a minute, I think uh, yes, what, what I found with the portfolio that I do uh, on one course is that when you try and um, make it serve two different purposes, one is some content and one is the more reflective stuff. Um, that's when students, I think, struggle uh, to then understand what the, the point of it is. So uh, articulating what they're supposed to be putting in, what they're supposed to be doing as a reflection, and therefore how they're going to be assessed to the student and to the tutors uh, is, is actually quite a task that needs doing uh, before you can make it work well. Yes, I think that's particularly true at a distance, um, John, where people really need to know what is it you want me to do. I think they can get lost there. I'm going to, Ken, I'm going to land on you and publish your question. I'll publish a question which I'm directed at you, Ken. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about what 
what you mean when you say you've been ungrading or, or what is ungrading? That's a topic for a week's seminar, but um, I'll point to the work of Dr. Susan Blum of um, Laura Gibbs at uh, Oklahoma University, I think it is. There's a lot of people writing about this much, much, much more than I am, but it's mostly taking away the points because if, if some people's reaction to ungrading or removing grading is if there's no points, the students won't do it. And, and I get that. But as soon as you remove away all the points, then there's no uh, return on investment of deciding which is worth more points with less time and students being excellent in economics. As soon as you remove it completely, then it removes that focus on doing it for the point. So it's, it's a much, much, much larger discussion. But I would point to the work of Dr. Susan Blum, who's on Twitter, and, and Laura Gibbs. And there's a large discussion um, going on on Twitter. Kathy Davidson's involved in this, Jesse Stommel and Shawn Michael Morris. And there's many others talking about this. And I'd be happy, happy to share links and resources. I actually registered the domain ungrading.net, but I haven't done anything with it. Um, and I need to develop that to point to a lot of these resources. Thanks. Thanks, Ken, very much. So do you give your students an overall grade? Is that what you mean? But you don't break down into the smaller grades or they get, it's, it's, it's all just pass or fail, basically, that that's the only grade. Is, is that how it works? I'm just trying to get into, into the roots of it. Um, so uh, a lot of people talk about it more, but I have to give a number grade between one and 100 because my university can't deal with zero for some reason. They say it won't work. Um, but uh, I have interviews with my students and we come up with an grade negotiated between myself and them based on them showing their work. And I have interviews with them and it's a lot of formative assessment during the year. Um, my students, um, to be fair, freaked out the first time I did this. I've written a bit about it on my blog, but um, it's complicated. But I invite anyone, even if you don't think you can do it, to just look at the work that other people are doing and, and have some reflection on uh, students only doing it for the points or not. Cool, thanks, Ken. Um, I think it, this comes back to what's the purpose of grading, I think, which you asked earlier, Ken. Um, and I think part of, uh, I think students like to get a mark often, but uh, as you said, at the university, part of, uh, the function of assessment for us is really to give feedback to learners and to bring them through that, that process in a way. Um, so it's, it's for the feedback and we, we make it um, summative to to sort of ensure they do it um, but but maybe there are ways you can do it so you can, you can have that feedback still if you like without necessarily um, as the form of great um, but I, want, I know that students at a distance often get quite stressed about what, it, what exactly is it you want me to do you know so you know how much you explain it you, you know you think you've explained it um, often you haven't explained it well enough um, good uh, I see some people typing so please come back on ungrading if you want to. I didn't, I didn't mean to make you spokesperson for ungrading. <laughs> it was just a, an interesting, I thought that some people might want to, um, to consider that. Thanks, Ken. Could I hear your dog in the background earlier, Ken? Um, another topic I thought we might think about is group work and collaborative work, which I think uh, John uh, touched upon earlier. Um, and something we do quite a lot of you know, at university. Um, I think, um, being honest, when we first when we first could do group work, we overdid it because you know, for us, being a distance learning university, uh, it went from not being able to do any group work apart from at summer schools uh, to suddenly, you know, on the internet we do group work. It's like, and it'd be like here's this week's really complex group assignment, which uh, which is actually very difficult to to manage. Uh, at a distance uh, and I think we've, we've calmed down after that initial enthusiasm um, but certainly you know being able to demonstrate that students have done group work is a is a key kind of like element of graduateness um, but there's always the issue around what your award marks for and those kind of things um, and if we are going to see a move away from exam and I think often exams are seen as the the check against that you know it's like you've been parts of group work maybe you've been swinging the lead a bit and everyone else has done the hard work but Will be found out in exams if you like. I wonder if we move away from exams, will that place extra emphasis on the group work being a, a kind of representative mark? And if anyone wanted to, to talk about that, uh, 
Claire, I don't know if you want to talk about your experience and you say that they had to reflect on the process. Again, that's something we do. We often ask people to kind of reflect on what they did and how that worked. Yeah, it's a new module on leadership and management, B329. Um, it was unassessed uh, initially, uh, and then they had to reflect in the EMA on how well they performed in their team. And it was about 50% did it, 50% did um, failed to do it for various reasons. But uh, the, those who did it gained a lot out of it. So I, I would recommend it. And more and more business modules are trying to integrate collaboration onto their modules because it's a key employability skill. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So I think we're going to see more. Does anyone want to raise any more specific queries about introducing group work or problems they've had or issues? Okay, I'm going to post the last of my questions now. Um, I was hoping some of my IET colleagues who are experts in this would be here to answer this, so maybe it's not a good question to post. Um, which is, what does the research say about assessments? If anyone wants to jump in on that, uh, you're welcome. I think there's um, some Madeline's sorry, interesting group work on business school programs. Um, I don't know if there's anyone here who's got, so are you interested in implementing um, you don't currently have it, Madeline. Yeah, so Claire says um, each person gets an individual mark for group work. Sometimes that can be based on the overall outcome or their contributions, and sometimes we ask them to assess each other on how they've done. So, Madeline. I so you want to speak or let's speak? Yeah, I'm, um, I've been involved in coaching on business school programmes and um, on programmes where there are a lot of international students. And the, the moment when um, a lot of group work is involved is often the moment when they really have to face lots of challenges in, in working as a group together in this very sort of multicultural situation and um, yes yeah, so I'm particularly interested um, in any other experience that that people have and, and are thinking about in this new situation um, whether you feel that it might be something that's a little bit easier doing it um, as part of a, an online delivery for a business school or any, any other thoughts that people have, to be honest? Thanks, Claire, for uh, jumping on the mic. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to sort of make, I think people often make sweeping generalisations about uh, different cultures and group work and those kind of things. Um, but it can be difficult to get people to collaborate. And I think um, what certainly now we're all going to be working remotely a lot more then i think you can emphasize it even more can't you? you're going to have to learn how to do this stuff because it really is part of everyday life um what i would say is those things need to be structured i think it's got, i said this last week so apologies if i'm repeating myself but um those things really need to be structured very well when you're doing them at a distance so you know, assign people different roles and make sure they know what each of their roles need to do um, and give them definite deadlines to reach certain milestones within a group task because otherwise you know weeks can pass and nothing's happened and they're sort of well I, thought I was waiting for this person to do something and i was waiting for them to do something you know and you might want to if you can mix up synchronous and asynchronous you know so um get them to come in and for a kind of synchronous time and do the kind of stuff that takes up time such as agreeing roles who's going to do what and then you know, to go off to do th those tasks sort of asynchronously um, and there are lots of good tools around now you know, to help people with that and to kind of um, gather resources together, whether that's collaborative writing or stuff. And, and uh, Claire's making the point about using blogs or vlogs um, 
to, to gather input. So you can, you, there are sort of there's a continuum of what group work can be. Sometimes it can be independent work that's gathered together to kind of form a whole, but all the elements are they're independent and very intensive group work, which is kind of where you're producing a, a joint output. And you can do arrange those things together. I think. And sometimes you can move up the scale. So Claire says it helps you move plagiarism if they do a vlog, as it's got to be them who's doing it. That's true, although I think you know we also need to uh, bear in mind issues around uh, privacy, and some people uh, may not want to appear uh, on camera online, and there are issues why you may want to respect that. Um, okay, so I'm going to leave it now for anyone else to ask questions. So please just jump in and. Uh, Uh, Mariano, it wasn't posted as a question, but um, so I'm going to copy your point, Mariano, and post it as a question, and it will appear on the, my screen. Um, so Mariano says, I think reflection is the most difficult issue for learners. It's most of them are new to it, and we've given the opportunity to see how it works. And I think that's right. I think it's um, we do it a lot at university, so we reflect on it. Um, and sometimes it can seem quite sort of perfunctory, like you, know, you asked me to reflect on something, so I'm reflecting on it here, I've reflected on it. You know. so, so I think it's difficult to do well, um, but I think particularly if they haven't, if the task doesn't give them enough kind of stuff to reflect upon, I think when you've had to do work through a process over, an, over a, certainly over a prolonged period, there's usually enough meat in there to kind of talk about what you're going to reflect upon. But, um, so Emma says, we have a weekly reflective portfolio task and another module to teach on. Students really struggle with this, and I, I, I bet they do. So sometimes, and I have, I, have, I have a lot of sympathy for that. And I was like, I don't know. It's like, I just sort of did it. You know, it's like, I think it, if you have to reflect again and again on that stuff, you can end up sort of just almost creating a, a fictional narrative about your sort of the reflective struggles you've been through. I don't know what's to come in on that. So I've pinched John's quest point here. A scale of an issue for many institutions doing online to first time assessment, maybe more so than any other aspect. I think that's yeah. So um, in the online pivot, we're sort of seeing um, everyone's shifting online and trying to shift your assessment online. You know, assessment is, is is the sort of crunch point for all, um, education, really. So I don't think wants to speak to particular problems they see in sort of scaling up online assessment um, for universities that aren't, need to, aren't used to it. Yeah, so Ken says um, his practice, his class size is 30, his idea is at scale. And I think that's a point. Um, not everything has to scale. Some things work well uh, at small scale. Some things don't. You know, and not everything has to be scalable if it works. So I think that's a good point to make. Um, John, a student comment I've seen several times: reflective art in equals creative fiction. <laughs> I bet, I bet that is the case. Uh, and Ken saying um, you need to kind of model it. And I think that's true. You can give students good prompts and good questions to do that method. And if you want to speak to that, Ken, about how you've managed to get them to do it. Uh, trying not to dominate the microphone. Yeah, Martin, I, I love your point about being very careful to not oblige students to do this. One thing I do is I tell my students, I do a lot of connective blogging and, and, and work with my students, but I tell them, Number one, if you don't want to do this, this is fine. You can do it privately, one to one, like old style, in, in quotes. Um, and then I also have to talk to my students about the dangers of being online and, and dealing with trolls, because uh, those of us that are white males never have to deal with this. Um, but it might happen to our students. So we got to be really careful about that. And I like that you pointed that out, Martin. 
but uh, the reflective practice is really important for me. And I've seen that my students are helped by modeling, not just by me, but the fact that I'm doing their posts in the open through a connected uh, courses setup really helps them see the work of others, their colleagues, their classmates being creative and being reflective. And that's one part I like about being um, in this kind of connected setup that I copied from Alan Levine. Yeah, good. Thanks, Ken. I think it's an interesting point. I don't know if some of you may have seen discussion online this week of us white men of ed tech <laughs> bashing each other. But Stephen Downs saying, uh, you know, now's the time to do the kind of crazy online stuff. Um, and, uh, myself, Brian Lamb, and Clinton on saying, not really. You know, students are shifting to online learning for the first time ever. Um, you don't want to sort of do highly kind of. Um, connecting with courses but often if they're studying at a distance that they don't know what it is they're supposed to be doing you know there's kind of too many unknowns that are thrown out there but I, I, I take Stephen's point and Jim Broom expanded upon it saying you know there's a danger that we we all shift to doing lectures via zoom now and that's it that's what you kind of that it never gets any further I think thanks Mariano Okay, anyone has any other issues or points, questions we can raise? And once we can, oh, there they are, it's almost exactly on the hour, so we can wrap it up there. I thought the uh, the question and answer bit worked okay. At least it kind of made the screen a bit more interesting. So thanks everyone for, oh, what have I done there? Coming in. I seem to have broken the screen or something. Good. Thanks, everyone. I'll, um, this was recorded. So I'll